Welcome everybody. Thank you so much with, for being with the Preservation Society tonight. And I'm so glad that so many people signed up to hear from our chief conservator, Patty Miller, because she does phenomenal work and you'll hear more about that later. Um, I'm also very happy to have the honor to introduce to you one of our newest fellows, a fellow that is going to be with us for the 20 and 21 season. His name is Francis Mann. He's going to speak in a moment. He earned his Bachelor's of Arts degree in Anthropology and Art History from the University of Delaware and his Master of Arts in Historical Archaeology from the University of York in the United Kingdom. Francis worked as an historic site interpreter at the Zwanendel Museum in Delaware. He worked at the, as a cultural resource administrator for the U.S. Virgin Islands National Park Service. And most recently, he produced interpretive content for the Preservation Society of Charleston's Charleston Justice Journey. Francis is going to tell us an elevator pitch, quick, quick pitch about what he will be working on this year as a fellow for the Preservation Society. And then he's going to be introducing Patty Miller. And I am very, very happy to tell all of you that the group of fellows that we have, including Francis this year, they are truly outstanding. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Francis, and good luck and thank you all very much for being with us. Thank you, Trudy. Um, thank you all for joining us virtually this evening for our 2020 fall lecture series. We are very pleased that so many of you have tuned in tonight to hear our own Patty Miller present on the Breakers Geothermal System, a 19th and 21st century solution. Um, as Trudy said, my name is Fran Mann. I'm one of the four research fellows for the Preservation Society this year. My project is concerned with building a digital database for the Preservation Society about Newport during the Gilded Age, and we'll hopefully be exploring ways in which we interact with history through art, sound, movement, and text. Before Patty begins, just some information about upcoming lectures and offerings. Uh, please be sure to join us on Thursday, October 8th, for the Chief Curator Emeritus at the Newark Museum, Ulysses Dietz, as he presents his lecture, Elegance and Aspiration, Money, Taste, and Jewelry in America's Gilded Age. If you'd like to attend, please send an email to programrsvp at newportmansions.org. Um, and again, that's program RSVP at newportmansions.org. And be sure the subject title says Ulysses Dietz Lecture. Next, our exhibition, Becoming Vanderbilt, is now open at Rosecliff on Thursdays and Fridays from 4 to 8 p.m. and Saturdays and Sundays from 1 to 6 p.m. You can go online to our website to purchase tickets for this wonderful exhibition where, where you will discover the women of the Vanderbilt dynasty. Um, and just some important information for you to know before Patty begins her presentation tonight. You'll notice that you and your fellow participants are on mute at the moment, and you will remain on mute for the duration of the program. If you have not done so, please turn off and mute your video as it is unnecessary for this lecture. There will be a Q&A at the end of the lecture. Uh, please use the chat feature to post questions during the lecture, and we will try to answer as many questions as possible. Now on to our esteemed guest tonight, Patty Miller, the Preservation Society's own chief conservator. Patty holds a Master's of Science in Historic Preservation from Columbia University and recently had an article published in the journal Studies in Conservation about the Breakers Geothermal System. Her presentation tonight will also be the topic of another presentation she'll deliver this November at the International Institute for Conservation, or IIC. Without further ado, here is Patty Miller. Good evening. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Good evening. This presentation will discuss integration of 21st century direct exchange geothermal technology with 19th century heat supply infrastructure to provide climate control at the breakers. The presentation will provide an overview of the original heating and ventilation system, followed by a design installation startup of the geothermal system and the challenges met. The principal themes of the presentation are preservation, innovation, and sustainability.
1892, Cornelius Vanderbilt II commissioned a 125 square foot Italian Renaissance style summer residence in Newport, equipped with the most modern domestic technology available. Today it is visited by more than 450,000 people annually and many return again and again to enjoy the architecture collections and landscape offered by this unique historic house museum. The house retains original architectural finishes, furnishings and a significant direct, direct decorative arts collection to give visitors today insight into America's Gilded Age. Interiors are representative of the highest technical finishes of their age, and the collection consists of more than 8,000 objects, furniture, textile, decorative arts, paintings, original to the house or the family. The mansion's original design relied upon the ocean setting for its natural ventilation uh, during summer occupancy, and a convection heat system maintained the building through the winter. A century later, risks to the collection due to extreme fluctuations in temperature and relative humidity, along with rising energy costs, prompted a climate modification feasibility study. A significant risk to the collections are large fluctuations in relative humidity, uh, which led to much damage of the decorative surfaces. Although conservators agreed that most objects had reached a state of equilibrium with the environment, conservation and restoration treatments undertaken to maintain and preserve the historic and integrity of the Breakers collection often exhibited poor aging or failure. A, re a stable relative humidity is required for long-term preservation of collection materials. Extreme fluctuations of both the temperature and the humidity were recorded in the house as part of a climate study in 2007. Shown here in, these, in this data, um, the month of August 2007, the fluctuations in humidity cause stress to organic materials through a repeated change in, in moisture content, leading to flaking of finishes, brittle textiles, slack in painting canvases, mold, increased pe pest activity, and more. In addition, the high humidity and marine environment can contribute to extreme corrosion on metal surfaces. Fluctuations, uh, therefore, must be minis minimized, and we aim to do this with dehumidification by cooling. The Breakers is one of the masterworks of the preeminent architect, American architect Richard Morris Hunt. It is actually the second Breakers to stand on the oceanfront site. You can see her here uh, in the corner. This is the uh, image of the original Breakers, which was a shingle style house built in 1879 by Peabody and Stearns for tobacco magnate Per Lorillard. Vanderbilt purchased the property in 1885. The house was then destroyed by fire um, by a boiler explosion on the day after Thanksgiving in 1892. Vanderbilt then engaged Richard Morris Hunt to, who designed a four-story, 70-room classical North Italian palazzo sheathed in elegantly carved buff-colored limestone that conceals a steel-reinforced masonry construction. Hunt's de design spared no details of modern improvements that could be improved by, that could be provided by engineers of the day. Luxuries included a heating and ventilation system typically reserved for large public buildings, but appropriated for the vastness of the breakers. The design util utilized a network of air shafts that facilitated cooling and ventilation in warm months, taking full advantage of the oceanfront location and supplied heat in the winter. Even though the family was rarely in residence during the winter months, the house needed constant airflow to protect damage to the systems and contents. Building began in 1893 and was completed in 1895 for the Newport summer season. To safeguard the structure from another potentially devastating fire, the underground boiler room was separated from the main house by a 360 foot long tunnel, shown here on the bottom left. Water was heated by two coal fuel burners and pumped to the main house through pipes to feed an indirect hot water system. So in this um, site plan that you see here on the screen, um, you, the outline here is the, um, basically the boiler plant. And then this is the long tunnel that reaches all the way to the, just below the entrance uh, portico of um, the breakers and enters the basement of the building.
Indirect hot water system consisting of a series of basement radiator chambers connected to air shafts embedded in the walls. Here you see a cutaway of one of these chambers outside the public restrooms. So in this image, you can see I've outlined the, um, hot, the main hot water supply and the water supply would enter into the radiators. Here are the horizontal radiators and exit the radiators. And down here, located down here is a chamber door. Uh, there are the horizontal radiators, um, there are the horizontal radiators and air from the sub-basement would rise through the shaft and passed over the radiator, warming the air as it rises to the rooms above. The designer for the heating system was John D. Clark of New York. His name can be seen on the chamber access doors throughout the basement. He also um, helped design the um, um, other buildings with Hunt, including the Biltmore in North Carolina, the systems there. Looking inside that chamber, you see uh, the vent through, the, uh, through which the air would rise from the subspace, sub-basement up through the chamber. This is one of Hunt's basic, um, this is Hunt's like basic plan of um, the breakers. And over that basic plan, um, Clark's office drew the radiator heating system for the house, which is shown here. Um, the white outline blocks indicate the more than 70 radiator chambers. So I'm just gonna, you see these whitish blocks here. These indicate, indicate the radiator chambers. And then if your screen is large enough, you might see these smaller shaft ways. And these are the air shaft ways connected to the radiator chambers. Air shafts embedded in, whoa. I don't know what just happened. Excuse me. Okay. <laughs> Air shaft embedded in the walls allowed for uninterrupted decoration of the rooms, save the one or two grills thoughtfully integrated into the design. Here you see in the dining room, um, the uh, heat, heat grills are actually masked in the bases of the columns and they, they have these decorative lion grills in front of them. Here in the library, you um, see the acorn motif used on one of the smaller um, uh, grills here for a small heat re register and uh, it uses the acorn um, symbol that is um, consistent with um, throughout the house as a symbol of the Vanderbilt family. And then here on the second floor in Gertrude's bedroom, you see a much more simplistic um, grill that's meant to fade into the Ogden Kaufman design of the, um, of the second floor. Up to the third floor, you still have the same air shaft and vent system in the family suites that are on the third floor. But over on the staff bedroom area, you have a more typical radiator system um, that is um, throughout both the staff rooms and also is found down on the um, first floor and mezzanine levels in the staff and service areas. Fresh outdoor air entered the chambers, or this in this plan right here, this is um, Hunt's plan for the basement with additional notes by Clark for um, plumbing and ventilation and in, in specifically air chambers. So in the 19th century, there was a great concern about getting fresh air into buildings that actually had heating of some sort um, to make sure that um, there was enough fresh air flowing through the house. So in the breakers, they use the northeast, southeast and southwest corners of the building um, as air chambers where fresh air could enter, be tempered by, by um, radiators and then flow into the sub-basement to then um, by convection uh, move through the radiator chambers and up through and into the rooms of the house. So this just shows the southwest air chamber um, where in this image these little cutaways here are indica indicating uh, windows which could be open so that's actually this space here so these windows could be open to let in fresh air and then um, 
There are uh, radiator mixing boxes in the space, which help to temper that air. And then the air would naturally flow down into the sub-basement or the plenum, which is this space just below the basement. It's about four feet high. So it's not the typical height of a, of a basement, but it's much more of like a crawl space, but it's complete, has a complete cement floor. As the heat and air would flow up through the house, it needed some place essentially to escape. And so there is a series of large skylights that not only help to light the, um, the ley lights, like the Lafarge ley light in the grand staircase, but also the smaller um, uh, clear uh, skylights that are in both the family stair and the, um, the family rooms on the third, I mean, yes, on the third floor. And those could be opened and closed and obviously helping very much in terms of letting um, hotter air out and ventilation in the summer months as well. Designing a modern climate control system for the breakers massive 125 square feet of three floors, attic and basement interior space, um, large interior space posed a unique challenge to engineers, architects, contractors, preservation society representatives and conservators. Instead of addressing the entire building, the primary exhibition rooms of the first and second floor that contain the most important collections and finishes were targeted. It was clear, however, that Hunt's original air supply shafts could be utilized to deliver conditioned air from this new system. Design to implementation took more than a decade and required resourcefulness and persistence from generations of project team members. The expense and complexity of a conventional system was deemed prohibitive, intrusive, and unsustainable. A high efficiency geothermal heat pump system was chosen because it could generate conditioned filtered air, reuse historic convection, convection heat shafts, and significantly offset heating costs. Since going online in 2018, this system has stabilized the interior environment and considerably reduced fuel consumption. It was understood that installing climate control at the breakers would have to respect the existing infrastructure, recognize the physical limitations of the structure to achieve the most appropriate environment for the collection according to current conservation and museum guidelines, and integrate the technology in a way that did not compromise historic in integrity of, um, of the landscape or the interiors and meet energy and sustainability goals. The efficiency and adaptability of geothermal made it the preferred choice for the breakers. Direct exchange geothermal, also known as geoexchange, ground source, or simply geothermal, is a heating and cooling system applicable in both existing and new buildings. It is ideal for si simultaneous independent control of different zones. The geothermal system has three main components. Shown here, they consist of a series of underground pipes called the geothermal loop connected to a heat pump unit and distributing the system via fan, uh, air handle fans and ductwork. The stable temperature of the ground provides a source for heat in the winter and a means to reject excess heat in the summer. In a geo exchange system, um, refrigerants or a fluid like Freon is circulated between the building and the ground loop piping buried in the ground. In the summer, the fluid picks up the heat from the building and moves it to the ground. In the winter, the fluid picks up the heat from the ground and moves it to the building. Heat pumps in the building make the transfer or exchange possible. The air handlers move the air through the building. Unlike a traditional HVA system that heats or cools a greater portion of fresh air from the outside, geothermal recycles the air supply within the building with a minimum quantity of fresh air needed. An early schematic design for the completely non-intrusive installation of geothermal, um, where air handlers move the conditioned air through the air shafts of the historic system can be seen here on the right. Um, and here, it's just kind of showing that idea of, the, um, of that plenum or sub-basement here. And these are the shafts. And a fan unit is basically connecting the shafts, 
pushing the air up through the shafts into the room and then eventually the air making its way back down into the system, uh, kind of returning through the air shafts and back down, essentially back into the plenum and back into um, the fan system. And if you think back to the original system, there was no fan involved. So actually the, the movement of air through, through the house with a fan system is far more efficient than the original system would have been working by convection alone. In 2011, PSNC was awarded a National Endowment for the Humanities uh, Sustaining Cultural and Heritage Collections Planning Grant to conduct a feasibility study to deter determine the availability of groundwater on the property to support an open loop geothermal system. The study concluded that water sources are not sufficient and therefore a closed loop system would be required, which is basically a Freon system. Using Hunt's original plan, the chief conservator, the then chief, chief conservator, Chief Moore, and engineer, Bill Ladika, mapped the radiator chambers and air shafts to the corresponding rooms. Arriving in the early morning hours before the house opened to the public, the two communicated through basement chambers and room vents using voice and air horns to determine how the shafts were in interconnected. In the new system would provide dehumidification and cooling in warm, humid months. In the winter, the heat pumps would provide more efficient heating. However, they would need to be supplemented by the existing second generation boiler system. In 2015, PSNC was awarded another grant from the NEH for implementation of the final system design for a closed loop geothermal heat pump system. A concurrent landscape uh, product rehabilitation project on the property triggered the review of the geothermal borehole locations by state preservation authorities to confirm that the proposed drilling sites would have no adverse effect on the historic breakers landscape. Here on the plan, you can see the location of the earth loops, which are completely buried and are in no way visible or obstructing the picturesque quality of the East Lawn. So these are the, these are the 15 geothermal loops. And that consisted of 75 boreholes. The system installation began in March 2017. 75 boreholes were drilled into the East Lawn just beyond the East Terrace. Boreholes were approximately 150 feet deep to bury 75 earth-linked copper loop assemblies and 15 manifold sets to serve 15 individual heat pumps located in the basement, um, which service basically the 15 exhibition zones. Over a period of nine months, contractors installed equipment and fed hundreds of feet of flexible ductwork through the sub-basement to connect the heat pumps and hydronic air handlers to the corresponding historic air shafts. The air shafts were fitted with metal barriers and baffles to deflect and restrict airflow to these specific zones. So in the photograph on the top, you can see them with the bore, bore creating the boreholes in the lawn, and you kind of see these little mounds all around here, which created the loops. So these are many of the boreholes already in the East Lawn. Um, and this just, these next series of photographs just sort of show how that um, those refrigerant lines then come into, um, from the East Lawn underneath the East Terrace. So they're coming through and underneath the East Terrace and then coming in and connecting to the geothermal um, um, heat pumps and the system. And then here you see the duct work where it was worked below in that plenum um, in the sub-basement. So it's passing through all of that, um, that space, that sub-basement space and connecting to the radiator um, and air shafts, the ra radiator chamber and air shafts. And then here you can see some of the, where it's fitted into the radiator chamber and here it's coming up through the radiator chamber. And then these uh, chamber doors were then sealed closed permanently to prevent air loss during uh, operation. So this is a, a schematic of how the um, layout of the actual equipment is in the basement. And some of those of you who maybe have been able to take the Breakers basement tour have actually seen some of this equipment now in place. So in this um, particular image and plan, 
if you can orient yourself in the house this is the front entrance of the house this is um, the back of the house for the east lawn area out this way so this is essentially the um uh the terrace um and these are the um individual units so when you see the orange indicates where the heat pump units are distributed through the basement um, the yellow shows the i mean the blue shows the air handler units distributed distributed throughout the basement and then the green are the individual air shafts that the units are connected to. The outline in red that you see is actually indicating um, the next image here which is the space that controls um, uh, or the units that control um, a space in the uh, first floor. So we'll go to the next slide. In this space in the basement you can see the heat pumps three heat pumps here, which um, control zones six, seven, and eight. And then you have a single air handler, although in the space there are two more air handlers for the other two um, heat pumps. And then you see the set of the three thermostats that connect to these heat pumps and air handlers. So the basement equipment here for zones six, seven, and eight uh, control a portion of the great hall and the entry foyer. So looking back on the plan, which actually shows air supply on the first floor, so now we're looking at a first floor plan rather than a basement plan, you can see here the Great Hall. This is the area underneath the staircase where the um, dolphin fountain is. And then this is the entrance to the house. And these are the three zones that those particular heat pumps um, operate. Again, as you look through this first floor, you see the morning room that has a series of its own heat pumps and connections. The music room has a zone. The library is a zone. There are just different individual zones to make up for um, the control of the system. To prevent intrusion from outside air into the zones of the geothermal system, air curtains were installed to blow a controlled stream of air across the opening and create an air seal, essentially. You're likely familiar with these air curtains at the entrance of stores in particular. Um, so also doors um, for, I guess the, this, this, these um, are, these air handlers are, I mean, these air curtains are located specifically at the upper loggia doors, which we like to keep open so visitors can easily enter the um, open loggia and experience the outdoor. And then when they re-enter the house on the other side by the guest bedroom, there is another air curtain. And then there is a third air curtain that is over the door to the staff stairwell when the guests um, exit the second floor and head down the stairs, there is another um, air curtain to um, seal off that section because those particular areas are not on the, um, on the geothermal system. And then on the third floor, because the third floor is not part of the zones for the geothermal, we have a temporary partition that was installed to prevent air from moving and circulating up into that particular space. In April 2018, the system was ready for initial testing of the air handlers. So prior to turning on the fans, the surface of the 123 year old brick and sheet metal lined air shafts were thick with dust and debris. Collections were temporarily removed or protected in place while air shaft cleaning and fan testing occurred. The air shafts were cleaned using a, special, a specialty dust vacuum cleaner with a rotary brush attachment. Filter media was added in front of grills to catch any remaining residue or particles when the fans were initiated. Once the system was tested and we were able to access the actual, understand and see the actual velocity of the air coming out of the vents, it was, we realized it was strong enough for us to be concerned about, the, about certain materials, especially um, this pair of gilded wood console tables in the morning room. Both the conditioning of the air and the velocity of the air would put these materials at significant risk. Therefore, these have been temporarily removed until we can determine a method to protect them when the geothermal is on. Monitoring system performance is accomplished using several methods. For the equipment, there's a special diagnostic monitoring program to keep the system running at top condition and manage maintenance needs. 
Thermostats have remote sensors strategically located in each zone, typically near an air return, as shown here. This is in the morning room, and it's, it's not really very visible where it's located, but I've um, called it out here on the right. So here is the return vent, and um, here is the thermostat sensor, and here you can see them up close in a detail image. Um, and then um, the sensor locations um, uh, we selected with the heating contractor to determine um, uh, you know, the minimum amount of disturbance to our historic finishes. Um, conservation also has 10 data loggers um, shown up here in the upper right, um, placed in strategic locations throughout the house to monitor temperature and humidity near sensitive collection objects or spaces. We rely on the data to manage and adjust the system for the protection of the collection. The system came fully online in September 2018. Windows and doors opened daily for ventilation were permanently closed and a few zones were brought online at the time. Uh, the initial set point was 72 degrees Fahrenheit to achieve 55% relative humidity. After three months, environmental data confirmed observations made by staff and visitors that the house was more comfortable um, and temperatures flattened with minimal, minimal fluctuation. Um, and the uh, relative humidity slowly improved. With adjustment of individual zone set points, rapid drastic swings were no longer regularly observed in the data. So these data sheets that you see here um, are from September 2016 to December 2017, which was when um, on the top, which was when um, the geothermal was not on. So this is when we had windows open and you can see, um, if you can see, this is, this is the mark for 80% um, relative humidity. And this is a mark for 20% relative humidity. And in our, our guidelines, we kind of like it to be between 40 and 60% relative humidity. You can see how often we went far out of that area. Um, in the October months, we were still getting high humidity um, in um, Mr. Vanderbilt's bedroom. Um, and then in the winter months, we would dip far below our 40% um, um, set point or desired air, um, relative humidity. So the house would get very, very dry on the oil heat. And then as we hit into the summer months, we would increase, rise um, steadily up, and then the humidity would get pretty outrageous in that room. And that room was really well known for um, really knocking the wind out of our guests. And, our, um, and we had often had people you know, need to sit down or be faint because of the um, severity of both the heat and the humidity in that room. Now, after the geothermal was turned on, we um, tracked one year of data. And this is in this particular data set is from September 2018 to September 2019, showing um, a, a significant moderation of the relative humidity in Mr. Vanderbilt's bed, bedroom specifically. And um, this uh, area right here, we're just showing um, an adjustment. We we're still adjusting the system from September through about November. Um, when the geothermal system was still kind of actively cooling rather than heating. Um, then as we moved into the heating months, um, using the geothermal system to help heat um, the house um, over the oil heat and using only oil heat to supplement um, the heating in the house, we only had a few in the very colder months where we actually went below our um, um, kind of 35% um, uh, relative humidity. Um, we kind of stuck to the line of about 40% relative humidity. And then as we moved into the summer months, it was very, very clear um, that we had a much more stable um, relative humidity operating in that particular room in comparison to the years previous. So a flat Lyman environment in a large historic building year round is really unattainable. In a 19th century house with a limited pathways for conditioned air delivery and daily loads from 3000 plus visitors in humid months, some concessions and environmental criteria must be tolerated. Other damaging conditions such as um, condensation on historic wooden handrails and marble surfaces were eliminated by the geothermal 
and air fil filtration significantly reduced dust accumulation on our textiles. Um, IIC, which is the in International Institute for Conservation, and ICOMCC, which is the International Council of Museums with the um, um, conservation um, uh, sector, uh, have a declaration on environment guidelines that they set forth in 2014. And these guidelines are a much more sustainable criteria than were um, observed by museums previously. So it allows for uh, more sustainable criteria to manage the museum environment and takes into account historic structures like the breakers. Keeping in mind that the majority of the museums and historic sites around the world do not have any kind of climate control. In 2018, PSNC opened the Welcome Center and the original Porter's Lodge was renovated for staff offices. Both buildings have traditional high volume air conditioning systems. Unfortunately, electricity on our property is metered for the entire property and not the individual buildings. Therefore, an analysis of the energy use must take into account an increase in electricity usage for operations, heating and cooling of all three structures. After one year in operation, however, fuel oil consumption for supplemental heating of the main house was reduced by 58%, and overall energy costs for the property were reduced by, 20, by 52%. Pre-geothermal, it would be typical to have twice we weekly deliveries of 800 gallons of heating oil in winter months. After geothermal, heating oil consumption reduced to 400 gallons per week to support hot water and supplemental heating needs. Opened in 2016, Beneath the Breakers is a separate, a separate guided tour experience um, uh, that, um, that takes the visitor through the historic boiler room and basement and explores the original 19th century technology, technology of the period, heating, electrical, plumbing, and mechanical. Today, geothermal technology is interpreted side by side with the historic heating and ventilation systems and visitors learn about the importance of climate control to help preserve the building and the collections. And in this image um, from, the, on the, uh, from the Beneath the Breaker story, you can see one of the um, original uh, vertical, I mean, horizontal um, radiators um, that came out of one of the shaft ways that was removed during um, some um, building projects in the basement um, a couple of decades ago. And we have that on view, along with um, the view of one of the air handlers. And just behind this view, you can see several of the um, heat pumps. So today, in accordance with current guidelines by the state of Rhode Island under our reopening plan for the breakers in early June to 2020, the geothermal system is currently off and the windows are once again open. We remain optimistic that things will return to normal soon. So I thank you very much for um, uh, listening to and um, watching this presentation. And I think Francis will now um, open it up for some questions. Um, and so while you are uh, thinking about your questions, I also uh, think it's important that many people uh, made this project happen, as I said, many many generations of people at the Preservation Society. Um, first, I'd like to um, reiterate uh, a thanks for many of the grants that we received for the geothermal system, which was from the national, um, um, from the NEH, um, from IMLS, which is um, the International um, Museum Library Sciences, who gave us grants to do our studies, um, uh, National Endowment for the Humanities, and then I'd like to name a few of the staff members that were um, integral in the development, design, and installation. Uh, Kurt Jenga, the former Properties Director, um, Jeff Moore, uh, the for former uh, Chief Conservator, Lawrence Air Systems, who installed and continued to maintain the system, and also Bill Adika, who works with us um, even today still on uh, climate mo modification at our other properties. Uh, so thank you. All right, thank you, Patty, for that. Um, and just a thank you as well to the Loeb's Family Foundation who gave to the project. Um, 
Susan and Dwight Saprell and Katie and Stephen Gerwitz and uh, Marion Michael Mariner and Sam and Ann Menkoff as well. Thank you for that. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, what I'm seeing is uh, what was the cost of the geothermal system? The grant uh, and the cost to install the system alone, so for the uh, equipment and the labor for installation was um, $300,000. Okay, and is there a reason why they're off now? The reason they're off now is because of the, um, the guidelines from the governor for our reopening plan was to have fresh air in the museum space in order for us to reopen. So it's off now pending the next set of guidelines that come from um, the governor. Sure. Um, did the marine environment historically balance the typically low humidity environment created by an indirect heated air system? Um, no, even I'd say with the house closed, um, the humidity typically dropped in the winter. Um, one of the challenges for the old heating system and one of the reasons that um, we get low humidity using just the oil heat um, or the boilers alone um, is because there is only in that system a single thermostat. Um, and so it's it really, and it's, it's located uh, just off the breakfast room. So it's heating for one particular location in the house. So it may be overheating some areas, creating microclimates or underheating some areas. And essentially just that type of heat used for a longer period of time in the house um, really did um, uh, cause low humidity. Um, in the summertime, once the house would reopen um, uh, for the season, um, then you would get a balance of humidity coming in, but then often just an excess of humidity because of uh, the climate that's right there on the coast. So the heat, uh, the, the humidity flowing in, the fog um, is problematic. Uh, when the house is open, we can see fog in the house. Um, here's one question about the earth loops. Um, is there a reason why the east lawn was chosen? And also, how are the loops brought under the east terrace into the mansion? So um, the, the original feasibility study looked, for the, looked to the possibility of using an open loop system, um, which would mean using um, uh, a well water on the property. So they went searching for well water. Um, they also found a lot of rock and shale on the west lawn because they thought that it would be on the west lawn. Mm -hmm. So um, the landscape itself was not as ideal for it. Over on the east lawn, we don't have very many um, plants on that area. So it's a very uh, large open field. And so really historically, that is exactly how the landscape is. So keeping in consideration that this is preservation of the landscape as well, they didn't want to disturb those plants and trees and historic areas that are in the, uh, the West Lawn, which we have now actually just done a huge restoration of, um, but instead put it easily accessible um, in that uh, location over on the East Lawn. Um, it actually made it uh, simple too, because they could be brought right up to the East Terrace. Uh, the borehole drilling could be brought up to that East Terrace. And then um, in the, um, the crawl space below the East Terrace, where the historic cisterns are, they basically bored through or drilled through a core hole through that um, exterior uh, terrace wall and were able to then bring the refrigerant lines um, into the house. It's a good, um, I'd say 40 feet of line um, coming before it actually reaches the house. And then um, incidentally, one of the limitations on the whole system and the placement of the equipment in the basement um, is just about the distance, the distance that the, that the system can have from the earth loops um, to the heat pumps and then from the heat pumps to the air handlers and then getting the air to the shafts. So um, I don't know exactly what all those limitation distances are, but we pushed it by putting all of the equipment along that east wall, locating it all there, and then bringing the ductwork 
back towards the west and or just throughout the ba the sub basement to go up those shafts. Yeah, it's interesting too. I think when you hear historic preservation, oftentimes the first thing you think about is just a house and its architecture. Um, but like you were saying, the lawn as well factors into that. So the landscape around the house is a part of the historic environment as well. If you think of a, a, a purpose-built museum with a large HVAC system that's required to maintain their collections, um, those are huge plants of equipment, which cause a lot of noise. Um, they um, uh, generate themselves a lot of heat, need to be located typically outside, sometimes on roofs. We just didn't have any place to put any equipment like that. Um, and um, for such a massive volume of space that this house is. Um, and then uh, uh, apart from that, you know, putting that on the landscape would then add another structure which didn't wasn't there historically. So that's why geothermal was kind of perfect because it could be placed below ground and is basically invisible to, to any changes and didn't make any changes to the exterior. Right. Um, this next one has a few pieces to it. Um, do other PS properties have geothermal systems? Are there any kind of set to be installed? And what will that installation process look like? So before they installed geothermal at the breakers, they installed it at two other properties. One was Chepstow, um, and that is a three zone, I believe it's three zones um, uh, for that museum building. And then um, we also installed it at the Elms Scholar Center, which is essentially one portion of the Elms carriage and stables. Um, so where you are right now. Um, and um, so, uh, those two properties received geothermal, and that is also looking forward, um, really, uh, towards sustainability um, in, in developing a system that is um, basically kind of typically thought to be about twice, have a, 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 a service life of twice as long as a typical HVA system. So whereas typical heating and air, con air conditioning might be 25 years before replacement, this is considered to be, you know, upwards of 50 years with maintenance. Um, and right now there are um, no plans to install geothermal at any of our other properties. However, um, we are looking into climate mitigation um, at another property um, with a grant um, uh, that is at uh, Chateau Sumer. Um, and there it's very significant because of the, if you've been in that house, you've seen the collections and the textile on the walls and the wallpaper. And, and generally the collections there are extremely sensitive. Um, and, you know, looking forward, um, you know, getting some sort of climate control for the protection of the collections and the houses and the finishes is ideal, but it is a long process and um, ultimately expensive but um, there's a lot of support grants out there and people interested in, in, in supporting this type of sustainable thinking um, in terms of um, museum environment, um, you know, mitigation. This might be a little off as an aside, but um, those pictures that you were showing us of the original vents with all the dust in there, um, you mentioned that the geothermal system is pretty much sealed off completely, but so is it, I'm assuming that results in no dust. Is that right? Uh, a lot less dust. So okay. dust, dust comes in on everybody. You know, all of our visitors bring their dust in, um, their personal dust. Um, and, um, and, you know, the doors open and close every day and the operation. But, and then the other dust is basically, sadly to say, deterioration of materials themselves. Okay. Um, so our collections often create their own dust. Um, and we have a... a a pretty high end um, uh, filtration, um, uh, you know, fil filtration is part of the system. So the filters are fairly high end. Um, and so they really help to remove a lot of that airborne dust from, um, from the air when the system is running. Um, but there's still dust in the museum um, and we still need to maintain it. But if you think of the red velvet furniture that's in the main, uh, in the great hall, they were, when I came on, I had them uh, carefully vacuuming with a very special uh, 
uh, collection, you know, museum collection, textile vacuum four, five times a year to keep that red velvet from looking kind of gray. And, and it just happens, it happens, it's happening now. But um, once we went to geothermal, it needed to be done twice a year. And that is, ex that is significant in the terms of taking care of the collections because the more we have to actually, um, uh, you know, intervene with the collection, touch it, clean it, we have the potential for damage, wear, and loss. Um, so we wouldn't want that to happen. Gotcha. And so well, with the geothermal, we have a lot less of that. I think that leads, uh, it's a great segue into this next question about the collections themselves uh, and the condition of the collection. Was there any notice, kind of any change with that as soon as the geothermal was implemented and used? Um, the objects, I'd say the objects themselves, we didn't see any major change. What we really have to, what you kind of have to think of in terms of the, um, the benefits for the collection is actually by controlling the environment, we slow down degradation. So we slow down damage that's happening. Um, and so really, if we, we, ha we saw a lot of, um, if we saw like that particular object I showed, the table with the flaking gilding, I mean, that's just extreme in the morning room, right? The doors were open there um, and, that, um, and that was losing it and flaking on the, uh, onto the rug. Um, but it's not that you, you know, that's far gone. So that's gonna continue to do that no matter yeah. what. Um, it may slow down a bit, but we definitely, um, we did see uh, changes in terms of, um, in the house itself, as it began to sort of, um, uh, I'd say, kind of equalize, you know, in terms of its temperature and its humidity, it slowly dried out. So think of the plaster materials or the stone materials, whatever, things are drying out. And um, we did notice a lot more curling of like paint on walls and issues with uh, materials like plaster that had shown um, previous moisture damage starting to sort of powder and fall off and fail. Now that is just the building and the materials changing in the environment and previous damage actually just then causing, you know, failure. So those are things that we knew we had to, we would have to um, fix in the future. But those, ra those sort of changes happened a little bit rapidly in the first couple of months where we saw, you know, a, like that as being the major change. Um, once the system was running, though, the benefit of it um, was uh, far fewer pests in the house, so flying around pests and bugs and things like that, um, and outbreaks of things. And then the other thing is mold, um, because no matter what, our house, my house, everybody's houses have some sort of mold. And once the humidity rises, it becomes, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's just everywhere, um, and it can start to appear and actually start to see it. Um, and um, we saw a lot less of that um, uh, as opposed to what we have to deal with sometimes in, in the summer months at some of our houses that don't have climate control. Gotcha. And I guess along those lines, so less mold, less dust, um, more controlled rates of humidity. Is there any kind of indication of salinity in the air, kind of any salt? So salt is um, the most, the biggest indicator for the aerosols, um, effective aerosols is um, if you're walking around on the second floor, primarily, um, note, note that a lot of the metals in the house had been restored um, previously. Mm -hmm. So um, some of the effects of the salt air, the sea and the marine environment, we don't see any longer because those were restored. Um, so, so effects on the, say the chandeliers and things in the, the sconces maybe on the first floor. However, on the second floor, if you walk around and you look at um, the, um, I think I showed a picture of one of the door hinges to the bathroom that's just across from the, um, uh, the doorway to the loggia, it's completely corroded, both the bronze and the iron. Um, so um, you have those metals corroding. And then um, you also have uh, the heat, the actual heat grills on that level. The closer they are to in the in the gallery up, upstairs, the closer they are to the loggia, 
the more green corrosion that's visible. Then you walk back further towards the elevator area and if you look at the, the, the vent grills there, they're fine. And that's not from human intervention, that's from natural corrosion from the marine environment. Okay, it looks like we have time for just one more question. Um, this one is relating to the actual system itself. Are there concerns regarding possible freon leaks as the system ages? So there was, uh, I was told that um, those sorts of things can happen. They, they, if there is a freon leak though, it's an environmentally, the, the product itself is environmentally friendly. So it doesn't do any um, long-term damage to the soil and surrounding area. Um, uh, that's why we have a very significant monitoring system. So um, it will, it actually has a, a full series of things that it tracks, including um, the uh, pressure on the, uh, the Freon, the refrigerant. So it would send out an alarm immediately if there was some sort of drop or change in the, um, in the refrigerant or the Freon. And that would um, then tell exactly which zone, which particular set of loops and manifold that is. And then they would have to um, obviously you know, find out where the actual particular leak or drop in the Freon is. And if it's in the field, then they would have to go to the field to repair it. So that type of sensor equipment, I'm not sure if it's on the system, uh, on the other systems. I know they have sensor equipment, but this is a pretty sophisticated diagnostic system that um, monitors just about everything going on with those particular heat pumps, air handlers um, uh, as part of the system. Gotcha. All right, we have three minutes left, so just super fast. Uh, could you give us an update on the Breakers Tapestry and what's going on with that? So in the image, I think it was like the second image of the Grand Staircase, there's the large Breakers Tapestry, the Carl Van Mander Tapestry from um, 17th century. It's been out of the house now for about three years, but it is the conservation portion of the work is complete. Um, we have some issues with uh, travel and transportation right now due to um, the uh, global pandemic. Um, however, we really hope that it can be reinstalled um, this winter. We're looking forward to it. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Patty, so much for the interesting lecture um, and everything you taught us about the Breakers Geothermal System. Um, and thank you, everyone, to who attended tonight's evening, tonight's lecture, evening lecture. Um, I hope to see you all again in a couple of weeks for Ulysses Dietz's presentation entitled Elegance and Aspiration, Money, Taste, and Jewelry in, the, in America's Gilded Age. Um, and until then, I hope everyone has a wonderful and safe evening. Thank you again, Patty. Thanks. Good night.